Welcome, Feel Good Fathers, to the show. I'm so excited. I have Sean Robison here with me today. He has a book, Going Dry, My Path to Overcoming Habitual Drinking. He's a speaker and a podcast guest uh, and a founder of the Going Dry Mindset. Really happy to have you on the show today. Thanks, Jay. I'm uh, excited to be here. I've been looking forward to it. Excellent. We were talking off air about both being in the Toronto area. Uh, I personally, I grew up in Scarborough. It was a nice little uh, recon- reconciliation and kind of connecting with other other Canadians. It, it's good to to do that, have that conversation. So, give us the intro. When did this be- this journey start? This going dry start. Um. Well, the it was an accumulation of a lot of things over the course of my life. Right. It was. It was. I was finding myself at a point where I didn't know what I was to do. I didn't know. I thought I had the answers. I work uh, construction. I'm on a volunteer fire department. I've been doing that a very long time and very masculine environments and a lot of just fix it, do it yourself. My dad's a mechanic. I grew up helping him in the garage. It was just very dominant. Fix it yourself. Don't talk about it. Don't be vulnerable. Um, so I grew up with that that attitude and, and and really got to a point in my life where I was at my extreme. It was, I call it my rock bottom. It was 320 pounds miserable, very cynical, impatient, just a, a whole blend of things accumulated to that point at the end of 2020 that just wasn't who I wanted to be. It wasn't, I wasn't proud of it, but I didn't know how to go about fixing it, especially being stuck in that, that mindset that I was in. So, um, as I started to journal uh, at the end of 2020 and just put some thoughts down and beat myself up, I really started to feel like that was helping just getting it out there that I didn't feel like I had to talk about it. So starting January, 2021, I started this going dry mission and really it just started at, I'm going to, I'm going to not drink for a bit. I'm going to not drink alcohol for the month of January and just see how I feel. What did you, when you started journaling, what led you to want to cut the alcohol? I just thought at 320 pounds with the habits and structure that I had, it was just maybe the quickest thing I could do to, I mean, getting through Christmas and all that and just all the parties and functions, it felt kind of ugly anyways. But then it was just the the easiest, biggest thing that I could say, Hey, you know what? COVID that, that year, 2020 was what it was. And I found my drinking a lot more because we weren't allowed to go anywhere. So at the end of 2020, it was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take a break from this for a while and try to see if I can take that break and maybe feel a bit better and, and not eat and overeat and over drink and all those things I was doing at the time. Got it. What, what kind of impact did this, this time period have on your family? Like what was your family life like? Um, well, I've got three young kids and my daughter was just born, uh, September of 2020. So, you know, leading, I have two boys older than that, but leading up to that moment, there was just a lot of an, an old environment that I grew up with that was about yelling and was about the impatience and was about aggression and um i have two younger brothers so just a very masculine environment in itself um a lot of the things that that i was becoming was the things i didn't like when i was growing up and my family life you know there was some moments with with just my drinking and 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 what that was for me that you know didn't speak well with my relationship with my wife that that was you know trying um no, that, that relationship with my kids wasn't as good as it could be either. So would you, what would you, I, I mean, I get the, the health implications of the 320, but what would you say would be sort of the, the catalyst for this change? Was it, was it your daughter or was it just, you were kind of upset with where everything was going? I think it was just, I was so upset with where I was at, um, you know, being on the fire department, I'm, I'm supposed to be in some kind of shape, but I wasn't. So it made things difficult. Um, and then just, just overall, um, it really got to a point where I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. I needed to be better. And, and I would learn much later what was going on in the background with some hard conversations that were likely coming between my wife or between, you know, different people. But in that moment, it was just more about how, how can I start feeling better? How can I do it? And to use your word catalyst, the catalyst for me was just doing something I hadn't done before by not drinking or by not living a certain lifestyle. So when you say, uh, I, when you say there were some things happening in the background, was this like, 
you were having these conversations and people were calling you out, hold, keeping you accountable, like there was a decent community around you, or was it you were hearing through Grapevine some some unsavory things were about to happen? No, it it was something I learned later. Like um, in that moment, it just didn't seem like anything was wrong. You know, working construction um, and in those environments, it was like you just drank on the weekends and and you did your thing and and you had the same group of friends doing the same things. So for me, it was was I didn't realize there was an issue, even though you know there'd be times at at, at a function I would probably drink more than I needed to and, and be miserable for two days after. It was like I'd find out you know, months later was that my wife maybe was afraid to to come to me about it, was afraid to come and talk to me about it because of how I would react or, you know, she couldn't see how I would change because it's so difficult for people to change. And and thankfully with the way I, I kind of developed on my own with that support in the background, it, it it changed and we didn't have to have that conversation. It would became a much different conversation. And a lot of what what I think is important for people to know and a lot of what I try to promote is that I didn't wait for that big event to happen. I was aware of where these things might take me and I got ahead of it in a way that that really opened it up to say, wow, this this was going to be that way. This this could result in, you know, more hardened addictions, even though I didn't feel like I was coming from from that directly. It was and then just just the other um things that that might come with family with with just the way the way society is so um as i would get through and, and learn I'd, I'd really learn what might have happened if i didn't decide to to start making changes let's suppose you're a father and you want to start a similar path to what you're describing journaling and figuring out improving your life finding habits finding routines that are unhelpful and and jumping in how would how would you start I think that the biggest thing is starting small. And before I get into that, we have a lot of pride, you know, fathers, we have a lot of pride, you know, I, I would say we're mostly stubborn, even though obviously there's, there's a difference from individual to individual, but overall we're proud, we're stubborn. Um, it, it, we don't like to admit we're wrong, all these things. And by deciding to change something, especially like for me, when I was not drinking anymore, to my kids, they didn't start to see that, of course, right away. But then, you know, what it was doing to everything else in the background, I wasn't drinking anymore, but then I was up earlier in the morning and I was more um, present with them. And, and when I had more energy because I wasn't more interested on standing around in circles drinking with the other people, I was like needing a distraction. So I'd go play with the kids. Like it was becoming a lot more, um, just a lot more for me um to that but the uh oh, where are we going <laughs> so the impact it had on your kids right so you were becoming more present which is super yeah. great you were learning about some of these unsavory uh character traits uh, a little bit more pride a little bit more stubbornness and you were getting up earlier kind of addressing your life and and improving things and that um that had a positive impact on your kids yeah, so they would learn much later because I, as I started to work through, and 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 I didn't know that I was going to just never drink again. So in the beginning, and and I guess where I left off was starting small. I committed to a dry January. That was just in an effort because I was so miserable and and writing these things about myself in this journal, and then never telling. I wouldn't tell anybody about it. I come from you know these environments that I'm not going to tell them I'm journaling, but keeping that in and 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 then having that that outlet and learning dry January is 30 days. I can get through 30 days. And when I got through that 30 days, it was like, okay, well, and, and there was a lot of struggles in there we can get into. But as I got to the end of that 30, it was like, I'm not done yet. I'm, I'm feeling great. I'm already feeling great. And I just want to, I'm going to try dry February. I'm going to do another, it's a short month, commit to a short month. And, and as I started to learn more about habits and habit structure and lifestyle change, I would learn how important these small steps were, how important it was that I, I circled every day on my calendar as I didn't drink or did the whatever that I was working on at the time. Um, cause I tried a lot of other things with this, this hundred day structure I ended up at, but starting small, keeping track of it and staying consistent 
you know, that was the biggest thing that that would kind of take me from that place I was at the end of 2020 to where I was quickly able to to start to feel better and start to have that more patience and start to to really feel like it was making a big difference. When did you discover that or or when did you start making more long-term goals? It and I'm, I'm asking this because it's it, it's clear in the beginning it was I feel like crap. I'm not happy where things are going. I want to make an adjustment. Was there was there a shift to more longer term goals? And if so, what what was that like? As I worked through through the structure of of, of getting to that hundred day mark, I'd learned about habits, and hundred days seemed like a good round number. It was, you know, a couple three months. It was, it was, uh, you know, some would argue it's that that um, lifestyle change versus just changing a, a small habit. So hundred days became the new goal. When I got to a hundred days and and I kept all this in my journal, which became my book, but that hundred day mark was like, you know what? I, I'm not, I'm not done. How cool would it be if I could do this for an entire year? Like in my lifetime, I, cause I grew up with an environment where alcohol was, was around all the time. It was normal. So how cool would it be if I could go an entire year, something I've never or not done since I was like early teens, not having any alcohol. So once I got to 100 days, it became, I'm going to do this for a full year. And all the while in there, I was testing this 100 days. My first, like as I started January not drinking, I just started by brushing my teeth twice a day. It was something that I could keep track of on the calendar that I could say, you know what, I'm not happy with dental health. I want to test this 100 day thing. I'm going to do this too. And I, I check mark every morning, every night on the calendar. I'd get to 100 days. I stopped tracking it because I want to test this thing, right? So I, I would stop doing it. And there was times I'd, I'd lay down in bed and be like, oh, I haven't done it yet. And I'd get up and go and, and do it. Or, you know, I'd go to leave my house on the weekend because that's that just that little bit of change in routine from going to work every day. It was like, oh yeah, no, I haven't done it yet. I got to go brush my teeth. So it just, it became such a, you know, a lifestyle change that I was doing this with everything from just doing one sit up a day to, um, you know, whatever. and the point with the 100 day thing I found was if I was doing, say, one sit up or brushing my teeth twice a day, those aren't difficult things. You know, you start with that small thing, you can do something like that. It's easy enough. But then once you get in the habit of doing that thing, say that sit up or, or brushing your teeth, it's like it's much easier to do two. It's much easier to do five, 10, 50. You build to a point. So starting small starting you know with with something that's that's achievable to build that habit structure then you start adding to it all of a sudden you know you're easily doing like right now i'm doing 100 sit-ups every day before bed it's uh, everything i can do to make sure i do it before bed most days but like it, it's so easy for me now because i got to a point where i added when i felt comfortable with it what were the changes that you noticed in your kids and your wife like what were the changes that you noticed in uh, in the past four years? I, I guess first, congratulations on four years. But what were the changes you were noticing in your family from from these new uh, habits and routines? So when when I was in that that old mindset and that old lifestyle, I wasn't reading books. I wasn't listening to podcasts. I was very much stuck in a, in a routine of the same music, the same friends, the same functions, the same things. And coming from construction, it's like there, and it's it's across the board. But speaking from my own background. Like you're, it's almost a, uh, a sense of pride. Like, oh yeah, I don't read. Like, I'll watch the movie, but I'm not reading the book. And while I've finished, you know, hundreds of books by now, since that moment, I, I wasn't getting the information to be able to translate into my own life that I could use. But I wasn't doing that to translate to my kids either. So, you know, things like I listen to a lot of audio books. I drive uh, an hour to work each way, and I, I decided to use that time to to more my benefit than the same music all the time. So listening to these audiobooks, I listened to John Gordon's Energy Bus and then Great book. Um, I, I love that book. And and the kids version too. Um translating to my kids, I brought that home because my middle child's very anxious and I was just looking for anything that I could do to start to translate and um the green the energy bus when he talks about in the adult version the greatest golf shot. And it's that shot, no matter how bad you played in the day, it's that one shot that keeps you coming back. And I started to, to do this at home with my wife, three kids at the dinner table. Um, you know, there's some really tough days. And I said, you know, let's, let's start this thing now. Like we're going to pick our favorite thing today. 
and we're going to do this like every day. I don't care like how hard your day was. It can be something that made you smile. It can be something that made you laugh. It was, you know, the, the wind picked up a certain way, just anything. And it was difficult at first, but when we went around the table, even my daughter who was, you know, just talking at the time and, and very much not coherent in the, in the game, she would just have a moment to say something. And, and while we would pick something out, it, it went from a very difficult thing to, we still do it now. This has been a couple of years and there's like a list of things. Everybody gets like as much time as they want and they pick out, my kids pick out everything. Um, and it's, it's such a cool moment that would have never happened if, if I didn't open up and start reading more, if I didn't open up to those things that were helpful in a way that I could learn, but then also bring them home. Love it. What, what did you notice in your, in your wife? Um, I noticed that, uh, well, I would bring home, so I would listen to a podcast or something and I'd, I'd come home and want to talk about it. I'd be like, oh, you would not believe what this person said. You would not believe what this thing, like, I got to get this book now. And she doesn't have that kind of time. You know, she works from home. Um, there's, there's all the, the kids stuff that I can't do with, with working an hour away and it's, it's busy. And you know, there's, there's a lot where I'm sure she could find some time, but for argument's sake, she just wasn't able to make the time. And for me to, to, to come home and talk about it, it was very difficult because there's just like, she can't all of a sudden start listening to an episode every time I come home from work and want to, you know, talk how great it is. So there was a lot of benefit that she was getting from, from me, from the bits that I could share in, in a way that wasn't her listening to the entire episode or wasn't a way that, so she was starting to try things, um, different things with diet, different things with with, um, you know, personal wellness and, and through even just the bit that I'm able to share with her, which, which is kind of translated to a lot of what I do in my speaking and in my videos and stuff that everything I post is that realization that not a lot of people have the time to listen to this many hours of, of content, let alone read, because if you're not reading it, then, then, um, you know, so to put it out there in tidbits that, that gives someone just that little bit that said that, you know what? Yeah, I needed this today. And through my wife, it was like, she was picking up on that. And then she was seeing what we were doing with, with the kids and, and really what, how that translated back to us, because we weren't, if we had a miserable day at work, we still had to, to try and find that one thing that, that made us happy, even if it was something that we had to come up with. And uh, there was, there was a lot of days where it's like, just that moment with my family at dinner was, was my favorite thing. And that was really all I could come up with because I didn't want to translate the kind of day I had. But it was just as it was as much the truth as well, right? It was it was really the favorite thing I had in a day, but maybe the, the only thing that I could find. I love it. Uh, this is such a great a great habit. I, I think that the the technical of a family meeting and and starting these habits and being grateful and kind of sharing at the end of the day is, is something super grateful. You've been traveling and speaking, and you've written this book that catalogs your journey. Has anybody? whose life you've impacted reach out to you and share their, their transformation. Yeah. Um, and that's been very powerful because when, when I was working through this journey and in the beginning, it was just about not drinking and there was a lot of pressure to go back. There was a lot of pressure, even dry January is 30 days, 31 days. And by the 15th, people around me were not doing their dry January resolutions they, they or were whatever. Scheduling, they were scheduling the party on, they the, were, on the 1st of February to get back to drinking. Yeah, right? yeah, they were done. And they were not even like, some people were like, the New Year's resolution was like, oh, uh, I'm done. It, yeah, I did a couple of weeks. So the pressure from people around me to just like, oh, you, you know, you made it. It's a couple of weeks. We're having a thing this weekend. Well, I'll go. Because uh, in my book, I, I I made some rules for myself that was like, I wanted to have fun. I wanted to still be around. I wanted to, you know, um, but I was like, people around me stopped do, doing whatever it was they were doing. So that pressure, but then also the functions and people, when we start to change, the people around us don't, they can't see that, right? We're still the same person when, when we see them. That's family, that's friends, that's coworkers, it's whoever. So it's like, we have to convince ourselves that we're becoming something different or that we're interested in something different. But then also we have to convince the people around us and that can be difficult. Uh, there's a, in my book, I talk about a friend of mine that I was in his wedding that, that year. And in the beginning of the year, it was just a break. And although I still, I, I don't plan on going back, but for the sake of the book, it, it was, it was a break to not drink. And 
every time he asked me, you know, you'd, you'd better drink at my wedding. Like, oh, you know, yeah, like that's that was September, October, the wedding. Like I got months away from that. And when I started to realize that I wasn't doing it anymore, um, at least was going to commit to the whole year, there was a lot of pressure to go back to that same person. So, you know, a lot of a lot of that uh, kind of behind me as I started to change. But when we when we go to convince the people around us, it's just important to stay true to what we want, right? Because they can't see it. We have to own it ourselves in order to feel good about showing the people around us that that we still that we still are the same person, but that we we are trying to do something different. I think that's interesting. Any any father, any feel good father that's going through some sort of transformation to improve their life, that there's this component of enrolling other people in that journey. What kind of, I mean, there's the drinking side. What other habits would you say that you came up with that were in a similar vein of this personal development, this personal growth that you had to enroll other people in? Um, well, it was, it was the, just being okay with, with changing, you know, drinking was one, not exercising or, you know, I, I go play hockey or something with the kids, but then to just go for a run was, was not something it was like, oh, I just, why would I go for a run? And, um, you know, things like, things like that. Uh, so when I started working on more, more fitness, just as intimidating as, as a lot of things are going to the gym to me was, was difficult because there's so many things that you can do and you're, you're going to do them probably wrong. So I thought, you know what, I'll work on some cardio and started walking. And, um, and then I, I found myself walking and then jogging and then I started running and, uh, I, never would have thought I would do any sort of organized event, but in a, in a, in a pursuit of just doing things that I hadn't done before to become a person that I hadn't been before. I, I signed up for a 5k race last year in, in the spring, actually a, uh, about a year ago now. Very first event, super nervous about it. Um, nobody, I knew, I didn't know anybody because of course nobody that I had been around before and nobody I hung out with did these things. So proving that to myself, running that event and a few others, um, really gave me, gave me confidence. And, and when I had people, so I've had people reach out, um, coming from construction, never feeling like I could talk to people about it, to have the people from that environment reach out and see the content I'm putting out, see the journey that I've been on, see the book, see the videos, see the whatever, and reach out and say, Hey, you know what? this is amazing. You've done great. Like, do you have any pointers? And to kind of coach some of these people through some stuff that I learned from, from a place that I used to be in possibly. And then just to hear their feedback to say like, this, this is amazing. Like it, it is such a cool moment to have someone that's like, especially in that, like, you know, masculine space to say, I'm doing this to keep it up. You don't know who's watching. It was a really cool moment. So let's suppose that you're, let's go back to the beginning. Cause I, I love these bookends. Let's go back to the beginning. So you're a feel good father. You have something that you want to, you want to do. Your journey was one of, of journaling. What, how would somebody start the journaling process and, and what, what should they, should they be prompting? Should it be open journaling? Should, should they be answering questions? Like what would you, what worked for you? I think the biggest thing for me was it's a lot of pressure to just now journal every day. Right. And I don't do that. But it, it, it was somewhere that in that moment at the end of 2020 where I was feeling miserable, it was coming out all the time. I just felt people around me were tired of listening to it. And my wife, who's great, she, I'm sure, was tired of listening to it. Because like, it's really heavy to be a support system for something that's doing that all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's not to a fault. It's just I felt in that moment that I needed just an outlet somewhere else. So that journal... Um, was a place where I could outlet that didn't feel like I was going to have to explain it, didn't feel like I was going to have to, you know, justify it, come back, defend it, whatever. And as I started to continue doing that, it just became a place that I went when I needed it. It became a place that I went when something good happened, when something not good happened, or something I learned. And it was a place that I just wanted to keep track so I didn't forget it because I had tried some other habit changing things in the past for different things as I'm sure we all have. And I just never stuck with it. I never stuck with it enough to get to that hundred day mark or, or to, to 
keep track of it enough to remember the things that I was working on or not working on. So the journal became a place where I could keep track of those things. And as far as a prompt goes, it was just even still, it's it's whenever I need to to keep write something down that that I just don't want to don't want to miss. And whether someone can get to the point where they're journaling every single day or you only need it when you need it. It's just a, it's a great place for me and it's a great place to have as, as a bit of a, a home therapy, if you will. Digesting what you're saying, there's the externally processing and venting. And at this past Valentine's Day, my wife and I went out and it had been a bit because we've moved and we have young kids and et cetera. So we went out and it was crazy. We went to this little wine bar and the couple to my left, because it, it was in the, the two seats. So it was like a, a series of two seats on the one wall, which is kind of standard for these little intimate. On the one, one side of the couple, uh, they literally weren't actually having a conversation. It was he was venting and then she would vent and then he would vent and then she would vent. And they actually didn't have any, there was no reciprocal dialogue. Right. There was no follow-up questions or nothing. So there was that thing going on. And then on the other side, it was he was venting a whole bunch and she was kind of supporting. So it was a little bit of, a little bit of like question and interest and stuff like that. And I just remember turning to my wife and saying, is this, is this what it's like? Is, is this what, is this what it's like out there? Is this, is this what people talk about? And I, that it was, it's very difficult because in this entrepreneurial business building, personal branding space where I live right now, everybody, it's like the, the handling of the, it's not like a toxic, toxic positivity, which is just as bad as toxic negativity. It's, it's this optimism, this I'm creating, I'm moving forward, I have, I have plans, I have gratitude and stuff mm -hmm. like that. In order to reach that point, it sounds like you need a valve. You need a valve that you can use that used to be complaining, that used to be venting, that used to be sharing all the negativity of your life. And then having that valve and transforming it into something that's, it's weird private journaling, right? You wouldn't necessarily yeah. hand like, here's all the bad things of my life. Here you go. Go ahead and read this, right? It's here's, I have this place that's for me between me and whatever, uh, where I can document these things. And then that allows for that allows the pressure to be relieved, but it allows for room for other stuff. Yeah. And it, it's, it, it's not always something that you need to have a chat about, right? Like in that moment, in that restaurant, if they if they both just got that out there, they probably could have, you know, been a lot different evening. It, it's it's right. hard to say. It's, you know, that journal for me was just that. It was some somewhere that I could just get that out there that didn't become an escalated thing when it didn't need to be. Because how often do we misunderstand each other when we communicate, right? Especially in, in a husband, wife or partner situation, it's like, it's natural, it's going to happen. So that, uh, you know, that that journal, that that element. and And the biggest thing for me too was, it was so difficult to even think about doing that because I was in such a space with work with my, you know, people around me. It was the, my upbringing. It was like, I couldn't do that because all oh, that's not for me. And, and just kind of making that decision to, to, to do that or to not drink at a function or to, um, you know, read that book or listen to that podcast. It was like, I was giving myself permission to seek the information or to control that valve to to let some more things in that were productive or positive and and stop some more some more of that negativity and cynicism that I carried around before. How did this begin? I'm I'm really interested in what again we talked about that catalyst, right? So there was the the three three twenty pounds, overweight, didn't, you know, just kind of want to try something different. How did you get into books? Like what what led you to books? What led you to podcasts? What what led you down this path? Now, the Feel Good Fathers listening, th the fact that they're listening to a podcast means that they've they've also hit this point. And so, for for you listener or for you watcher, wh what was your point? Share in the comments. What was your point? When did you start your personal development journey? As Sean is sharing his, for me, it was it was really that commute to work, um, and just realizing that I wasn't using that time uh to I, and i couldn't right you you you're on a commute you feel like you know i just gotta pay attention to the road and obviously you gotta do that but for for me it was like 
I wasn't wanting to listen to a ton of new music. You know, I always bugged my dad growing up because he didn't want to either. But I think we get to a point where just we're comfortable where we where we're at. And while we appreciate, I appreciate new music. I love music, but I just needed something else. And and I, even podcasting for a while was like, oh, I can't do that. That's for those people. And I didn't know what that meant. But it was just it wasn't where I came from. It wasn't what the people around me were doing. So to talk about a podcast was like you were, you know, whatever. So because I started to do that, like, I don't even know where to begin because, you know, there was, there was a ton of, there's a ton of different podcasts, but like, where do you start? So, um, I found myself on the school of greatness. I found myself Mm. on, um, shows like that where, where they had some celebrities on And, and I can't relate to, you know, Kobe Bryant and his journey, but you know, I can at least know who that is. So to hear someone like that talk about leadership, to talk about wellness, to talk about lifestyle and all of the things that they're doing with themselves and their families and their lives and whatever, you know, Terry Crews and Jim Carrey and and all these people, I felt like I could at least pick apart some of that stuff and relate to some of that. So then I got into a bit of a wormhole of, you know, of listening to these things and different content and then going from the celebrities and and those people that I that I felt like I knew to the Andrew Hubermans and the Carolyn Leafs and 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 the people kind of behind a lot of that content that are giving more of the scientific explanation and and of course everyone has their their books so I'm I'm interested in Terry Crews manhood I'm interested I've read that I've I've got into you know mindset Carol Dweck and I've got into so much more content because the people that are that I'm listening to on these shows have this behind them and then not only am i getting the concept behind what they came up with but then i'm I'm going back and i'm getting their books and listening to the thing and the system's kind of working that way but because i'm in that personal development space all of this is compounding growth and, and really using that commute to and from work or I'd be, I'd be cutting the grass and just have my headphones in or when i'm going on my runs or something put a podcast on or whatever and just really using that time to more benefit than listening to that same song over and over. You're in Canada. This is a, maybe a silly question. Do you run all year round? I know, uh, I have a treadmill. <laughs> um, I, I ran a 10 K. So I did four events last year, two five Ks. And then I did a half marathon in October, which was the hottest day of the year. First, second of October, which was not what I thought I was doing. Challenging to a half marathon, but you know, whatever. And then I did a 10K in November. So I did the 10K in November. It was my fourth and last uh, organized event of the year. And then really winter hit. And we didn't have much of a winter, but I just didn't get out in the cold. And just other life stuff happening and, and work stuff, um, promotions and stuff. So, so not bad, but things that took me from it. I didn't get out in the winter. And I've got a, another half marathon at the end of April that uh i've signed up for that i'm I'm really gonna get into because <laughs> you know that went those winter months were were hard what did you and i i empathize that as field of fathers just found out I, I grew up near toronto as well so i understand what the winter was and um, i'm down now in nashville which is amazing uh you can pretty much be outside all year round so i'm kind of curious about about your experience and whether you you continued in the colder months you, we haven't really asked too much about this, but you, uh, you said promotion and then there's the work you're in construction. So you're outside a lot. You're doing all that kind of jazz. What happened with your social group? What happened with your work group after this transformation? Um, I think this was actually something that I was really worried about as I started to, to learn more about this stuff was because the, the constant thing that the, the common theme was that you're going to lose your friends. You're going to mm-hmm. lose the people around you. and you know, I think, I think there's a lot more focus on that negatively than there needs to be. Like you're going to grow apart from people as you're going closer to other people. It's, it's what happens. You start a new job. Unfortunately, your best friends at your old job, you may grow further apart. So it's not just in, in a wellness space, but as I started to grow and I started to develop, especially because it started around not drinking. And then, as I mentioned, I had the rules in place. I had the things that I was that I was trying to do to to keep going. Like there was people around that didn't drink before, and I always felt like they were just judgmental. They were just they had their water bottle. They were maybe just twisting the empty bottle around their hand, fiddling with it because they weren't ready to leave yet. And I just felt so much judgment from the people that weren't drinking to 
the people that were drinking. So as I started to get into it, I was mindful and self-conscious of that. So I didn't want to be that sober person twisting the water bottle around, making everybody else feel like they shouldn't do what they're doing. I'm not making anybody change their habits, right? I, it was what it was to me. So if someone doesn't want to drink or wants to start brushing their teeth, it's, it's, I want to be a good example, but you're going to do what you want to do. So uh, as I started going through these things and, and, and these functions and, and, and really um, um, changing that, I did naturally grow further apart from people because I wasn't up until two in the morning just completely smashed and, and pushing as far as I could every one of my boundaries. It was like I grew a bit further apart from those people and I still have great friends that I run into, but as my, as my interests started to change and things started to change, I just naturally grew a little bit further apart and I grew closer to other people. There's people in my circle now that I'm especially getting into a running space. I'd never, I'd never done that. I, I, I ran four events and saw maybe one person I knew. And there's like hundreds and thousands of people at these things. Um, so to, to see nobody and to be so, and I've done a podcast about it, uh, uh, speaking directly about how I felt it wasn't qualified, but like, um, it was like, just being in that space and not knowing anybody was such a cool feeling because um, it was like a signal for me that I was getting closer to where I belonged, right? And um, as as frustrating or as as it was to to feel like I was going to grow further apart from people, it became a little bit more gradual than just simply you wake up the next day and you don't have friends anymore. It was it was just something that happened naturally, and it was a lot easier to to navigate. Love it, I absolutely love it, and I think that any. Uh, we're always concerned with our personal development, our personal growth. The, the big one for fathers is the introduction of kids, right? There's a huge shift in in your lifestyle uh, when that happens uh, that can that can create some of these different things. And I, I love the the encouragement that some people will will leave, some people will will come in. There's a there's a river of your life as far as your social network. Uh, one of the the final final concepts or content I'd love to talk to you about is how did your family like what kind of change with your family? And I'm thinking like the generation above, like the, the older generation, like what was that experience for you? Um, that was, um, that was a bit of a challenge. Um, my parents are still together. Um, when I wrote the book, I didn't share. And then the book, just to back up a little bit was my journal. I got to about the October uh, part of that year of commitment. And a friend asked me, you know, how's everything going? And this was at a drinking event and I wasn't drinking. And anybody said, Oh, how, how's it going actually? And I said, oh, shit, I could write a book. And then I was like, wow, like I really, I really have written this thing. And it was, it was just for me, it was very vulnerable. And it was like, I got to that point where it was like, wow, I could, like, I really could have used this when I got started, when I wasn't wanting to listen to the professionals, when I was getting into podcast space where I didn't really know that I belonged there and, and just a lot of that. So when I started to, to write that book, it was also with my parents and, and, you know, family in the background that was like, I wasn't telling them what I was writing about. I was careful because there was some stuff that kind of went through that, that I didn't really want to try and explain or didn't want to hear about or, or have that conversation with my parents. But for the sake of it, it was like, um, writing it and not sharing it. Well, my mom, when I, when I put it out, it was, she was upset because she didn't get a chance to read, read it first. Mm. And I was like, well, I didn't, I didn't want, and it wasn't just her, there was others, but like, I didn't want that influence. And like, there isn't anyone named in the book, even like my best friend who was getting married and I was in his wedding and I had a lot of anxiety about having to show up a certain way. It was like, I don't name anybody because it isn't about the people around me. It's about how I handled it or what I was used to doing or, or what, what the situation meant to me and what I was trying to do. So those people around me, like when that book came out and I got like in trouble or whatever from my mother, she called me, it was like upset. There was a, there was a lot of different pressure there. There was a lot of, because they were worried what I was going to write about. They were going to, they were worried about how it was going to look to them or how they were going to look. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't about that, but to navigate that and navigate an old lifestyle and to navigate a lot of what we grew up doing that I would, not want to do anymore. You know, I would want to change the things I do with my family than what I went through and whether I'm stopping a version of generational traumas and trying different things, being more understanding, doing favorite things at dinner because I know it helps, uh, you know, anxieties and things 
to turn the day around. Um, you know, that was, that was more important to me than, you know, maintaining that old version and to satisfy, you know, my parents or whoever. Awesome. Where, where are you going from here? What's, what's in the store for you, Sean? Um, well, from here, I'm, I want to keep, I'm going to keep growing. I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to keep uh, learning. And, and, you know, my kids are young. I think of three under 11 and, and there's a lot that I want to learn that's going to translate better to their generation. You know, I, I'm in my own generation, but as we learn, I was raised in my parents. My parents tried to use their generation on, on me and my brothers, but we can't do that. We, we have to teach to the generation that is right now. So there's a lot that I, I want to learn to be able to set my kids up better for the generation they're growing up in than the one I grew up in. And um, what that means, it, you know, it's going to grow as, as much as it has already. So it, it's ever changing. But for me, I want to I want to continue to do that, continue to show up for for my family and my kids. I want to, you know, just just keep growing, and I want to share as much of that as I can to, to hope that other people learn that you're never stuck. You know, we we can change anytime we want to. We just have to want to. Excellent, Sean Robinson, everybody.